In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant by the same Spirit. We may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ave Maria. I don't need to tell you that we're living in a great confusion today. Um, and there are the confusion is made worse because of a misuse of language. And words, they're, they're what are called sound bites. So just short phrases are used, and it seems to capture a whole idea. And that itself causes confusion. And part of the reason is because we don't go beyond the meaning of the phrase, or even sometimes the meaning of the word. And uh, that, that's what I'm trying to stress, that it's important that we focus on the words that we use and the meanings of those words. So, we, we, as, as we know, the, the, um, the word, for instance, gay, used to mean someone who's happy, you know, someone who is bright and springy. But today, it has an entirely different meaning. Um, and that's just one example. In addition to that, there are symbols which have also been captured, such as the rainbow. Um, again, the rainbow was a sign of hope. God placed the rainbow in the sky to, as a promise, and also as a hope for uh, believers. And that also has been captured, so that it now has a sort of negative connotation, uh, ideological meaning to it. And so the, it's, it's important that we grasp the meaning of words and how they've been used and manipulated to manipulate our minds as well. So let's take an example of how a, a word could be misused. The word good. You know, often when you read the newspapers, for instance, and we hear the death of some um, drug um, peddler, or some um, criminal, someone involved in criminal behavior, you know, and the, usually the mother will come and say, oh, he was a good boy, you know, or, you know, the girlfriend will say, yes, he was so good to his children, or he loved animals, he was good to animals. But what, and we ourselves will, when, when things are going bad, we say, well, Lord, Lord I am a good person. You know, very few people will say, I'm a wicked person. And some might say, I'm a sinner, but they don't really mean it. You know what I mean? So let's take a, let's, let me give you an example. This, a, little, a, a boy, seven, boys are good examples. A boy is seven years old, you know. And um, he asks to, to go out to play. And his, his mother says, no, you can't go out. He says, oh, mom, please let me go. No, I'll be good, I'll be good. You know, and that might, you know, encourage the mother to let him go under certain conditions, you know. Or the, the boy wants some money, you know, to, to go out. He says, Mom, you know, can I have um, five pounds, you know. He says, no, I don't have five pounds. Oh, please, Mama, give me the five pounds. I'll be good, you know. She says, you'll be good if I give you five pounds. He says, yes, Mom. He says, well, why can't you be good for nothing like your father, you know. <laughs> Same word. Yet the context gives it uh, the meaning. You know. So God made us in his own image and likeness. That's from scripture, Genesis chapter one, uh, verse 26. We're made in God's image and likeness. What's the difference? What's an image? Well, we talked about images before. An image is a copy of a, a reality. You know, God is the ultimate reality, the only reality. 
And he's made us in his own image, so he's given us qualities that he himself possesses. Fundamentally, basically, the ability to know an intellect and ability to choose or to understand, to choose that which is good or that which is evil. He's left us free, in other words. The goodness has remained. The likeness has not. So in image, we, we've retained God's image, which is good. But the likeness really relates to behavior. So we have in fact chosen evil, which is something God would never do. And it's this um, likeness that Christ came to restore, you know, the, to, to enable us to be truly good in, in the in the very depths of our being and of our behavior. Now to do this, it requires that we follow a law. And this, this is really where the problem begins, because today the observance of law is a no-no. People do not want to, to obey the law, unless of course the law impacts, uh, or breaking the law impacts on them negatively. We live in basically a state of anarchy. But our Lord himself said that he didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. But, but even before we go there, we need to understand what is the purpose and the meaning of law. The, the law, as we... Uh, as, as we understand it, uh, if, as we understand the word law, it, it has many aspects. Now let's, let's take some, ex some examples first before I, I, I go into explaining anything. When, when I was in school, I, I was very fortunate because I, I, I was also able to do practical things apart from academic. So, one of the things I did and enjoyed doing was woodwork. And um, we had a very good wood woodwork teacher who insisted that we use the tools for what they were intended. So, for instance, a screwdriver was meant to, to screw or to unscrew screws. You couldn't use it as a chisel. And equally, a chisel was meant to cut into the wood Okay? And you should not use it as a screwdriver. And a hammer was for hitting nails, and a mallet was for hitting tools such as a chisel. And you couldn't interchange the two. And he got very upset if we violated that rule, that law. And there's a reason. Because the purpose of a screwdriver is to undo a screw or to do a screw. If you use it to pry open something, you're going to bend the end of the screwdriver and so damage the screwdriver. Equally, if you use a chisel to undo a screw, you're going to damage the blade. And so the, screw the, the chisel becomes, is now useless for actually cutting the wood. Okay. And if you use a claw hammer to, hit, to um, knock the, uh, uh, the, the chisel, you're going to damage the, the chisel, and so on. So, tools have a particular purpose for which they're meant to be used. And if you do not use them for the purpose they were intended, if you don't use them for the purpose they you're going to damage them. Or, to be more accurate, you're more likely to damage them than not damage them. In other words, some might get away with it. You might be, use it inappropriately and get away with it. In nature, there are laws. We, we call them the laws of nature. And we know them um, from experience, or sometimes instinctively, and sometimes we don't know them at all. So, for instance, in the law of physics, let's see what happens. I have an object which I hold and I let go. What happens to the object? it will fall, usually. Sometimes it will go up. Well, if it falls, 
we know that there's a law operating. It's called the law of gravity. If it goes up, however, we know there's another law applying. So, for instance, if you have a balloon filled with helium, which is a very light gas, and you let it go, it will go up. Why? Because the helium, the gas in the balloon, is lighter, less dense than that of the atmosphere around it. Yes? And so it will rise. Or, in, in the case of a hot air balloon, the same applies. So, there are different kinds of laws, and some laws are greater than others. You know, in the same way, if we have um, water and we mix it with oil, what happens? We we'll let it settle, the oil will rise to the top. Okay, but if you were to mix that same water, say, with um, uh, salt, the, the salt will go down to, go down to the bottom. Okay? Um, it depends, basically, on another law being applied, namely the law of density. Okay? So, if you put a solid in, in water, it will sink usually, and if, if it's lighter, like a liquid, like oil, it will, it will float. Density applies. In the, same way, in the same similar way, we have the laws of biology, which are varied. And in the case of biology, we usually give them very, those laws very big names, like um, geotropic and phototropic. Okay. Geo means Earth, okay, and tropic means to turn. Okay, photo means light. So if you take a seed, any kind of seed, a bean for instance, and you plant it, it doesn't make any difference whether you plant it the right way up, upside down, on the side. Because what will happen, the, the, the bean will start to obey the, one, the law of life, okay? And it will send out uh, a shoot, a root. The root will always go down. So even if the bean is upside down, the root will go downwards. It will go towards the earth, turn towards the earth, geotropic. And then it will send a little stem, which is looking for the light. So even if the stem's at the bottom, it will go upwards looking for the light. That's simply the law that it obeys, the law of its nature. The same way the sun, flower, will always turn to where the sun is. Okay? And these are called heliotropics. The helio meaning sun, so it'll turn towards the sun. Um, and so on. So the words matter. They will tell us, if we understand the meaning of the word, it'll tell us something about the kind of creature we are dealing with. The laws, these are called laws of nature, and they help us to classify the various creatures whether the creature is inanimate or whether it's animate. That is, whether it has life or whether it doesn't have life. Okay? So a stone is always a stone. Stones do not have eyes. They don't need eyes. Birds, this is a good thing to talk about, birds. What do we know about the bird? We can describe the bird. It usually has a body and a head and wings and feet. Two wings, two feet. It lays eggs. And that's about all we need to describe a bird. But there are different kinds of birds. Okay? But the basic necessity, the basic requirement is it has a body, it has two legs, it has two wings, feathers, and lays eggs. But there are other creatures that lay eggs, aren't there? Snakes lay eggs, but they're not birds. They don't have wings. They don't have two legs. So we, we put all of these character, basic characteristics to tell us what a bird is. When we think of birds, immediately we think of flying. Birds fly. 
Yes, but some birds fly, not all birds fly. So flying is not a necessity, an absolute necessity for a bird. It's a convenience, you know. So ostriches don't fly. Kiwis don't fly. Penguins don't fly. Okay, but they have wings. Um, the other thing is that we know that the the um, that's that the the birds, in fact, all creatures, follow uh, a certain behavior. Okay, and we and th this behavior is essentially what we call the law, the law of their nature. And once we recognize what the law is, we can deduce what. Um, the, the purpose of, of the, the thing, if, if that makes sense. So, once we, we, we can know what a thing is, when we know what, it's, what purpose it has. Okay, so in general, things have parts. Yeah. So, the birds have wings, they have legs, they have eyes. And we can know what the purpose of a particular part is. So, if we, we take eyes, we know that eyes are for seeing. And we know we can take a, the eye apart, so we know what each part of the eye is. So, if the eye, the, the muscles of the eye are weak, and the eye doesn't, is not able to work perfectly, it's not able to see, we can correct it, and basically by using glasses. Okay, in the same way for the air. If the air is not functioning properly, we can correct it. You know, with a hearing aid or perhaps even surgery. But what when we do when we make a correction, we are not going against the nature of the thing. We in fact restoring. The, the, the thing, the eye or the air, we, we're making a correction to restore it so that it functions according to its nature. Okay, I hope that's clear so far. And in this way, we are enabling the, the creature to be as close to perfect as possible. Now, in, let's take an example. If we, if we have um, someone who, who is, is born with a disability, you know, um, what, 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 what would doctors do? They would try to correct that disability, you know, if it's physical, so that the person, the, the child, is as, as close to perfect as possible. So, for instance, if someone's born with a helip, you know, you have surgery to correct that. If someone has a speech impediment, well, there are exercises or perhaps even surgery which will correct it. Many centuries ago in China, the, there was a princess who was born with a club foot. You know, that's where the arch, the, the, the foot is, is, is bent. So it looks like a club rather than a, a foot, uh, the normal foot. Well, there wasn't surgery in those days. The emperor was very upset. So he didn't want his daughter to feel different from everybody else. So he passed the law. All women, all girls, from then on, were to have their feet deformed. So they, they put a piece, a block of, of wood under the the feet of young of, of of girls, young girls, and bandaged it. So their feet became deformed. And so right through China you have these women now with deformed feet. So that this one girl, the, the, the princess, wouldn't feel different from everybody else. Does that make sense? We deform he was deforming everybody else so that this one would not feel odd. 
That makes no sense to us, does it? Yet, isn't that exactly what is happening to us today? When there are a few people in God's providence who have some um, deformity, whether it's a, a, a um, physical or whether it's emotional, whether it's psychological deformity, you know, such as th those who have a same-sex attraction or those who have some gender issue, boys who feel as if they're girls or girls who feel they're boys, they f you know, which isn't normal, it's not the norm, you know, and so what's happening, S society, or at least the ideologues who decide these social issues, are trying to get everybody to conform to these aberrations in nature. So when, if we just use the worst statistics, which says that 10% of the society of the society is, is homosexual, that's an exaggeration. We know that it's certainly less than 2%, you know, but we use the 10. So the 90% have to conform to that 10%. Does that make sense? Anyway, but this is basically what is happening. So we need to understand what nature is in order that we can um, deal with the issues, the misuse of language and terms that is currently overwhelming us. Because we no longer um, live in according to our intellect, which is um, designed by God to receive the truth, but rather our feelings so that we conform, we behave, not according to, some, to the absolute truth, but rather to how we feel. Yeah. So let's um, look a bit about, uh, talk about a bit about nature. Nature consists of basically two kinds of creature. We're talking about the visible nature. The, you know, the things around us, this world in which we live. There are two kinds of creatures. The first, the inanimate. These are the creatures that do not have life. So, we can talk about stones, earth, rocks, you know, um, water, minerals. And then we talk about the animate that is, the creatures that do have life. And in the, among the creatures that do have life, there are two categories. There are those that are irrational, that is, they behave according to instinct, and those that are rational, namely, we, human beings. And being rational, essentially, we have instinct, as do the ordinary animals, and we have reason. So to give again an example, a stone is always a stone. You leave it there and you come back and the chances are it will still be there. It's not going to go anywhere by itself. Someone may come and move it, yes. Something may come and move it, yes. But it will stay there. An animal an irrational animal, on the other hand, is slightly different. Okay, because it has the capacity to move. Yes, it has the ability to know what is around it. Okay, but it will always move according to instinct. So, to, to give you an example, you take a snail and you put it um, on, on, the, on the table. It'll, it'll move around perhaps. But if you shine, if you put a heat source on it, a bright light of heat, it will certainly move because it recognizes instinctively there's a danger and it doesn't want its body to dry out. The same for any other animal. You put it there and it'll, 
instinctively try to protect his life. So the living animals um, fall into basically three kinds. Okay, there are the vegetative, okay, which are essentially plants. Okay. Plants, what do they do? Well, they take in nourishment and then they, what else do they do? They take in nourishment and then they grow, okay, and they reproduce. And that's it. They do it instinctively. If they have water, if they have nutrition, they're able to grow. And if they have um, the, the things required, namely the, the counterpart, they will reproduce. Animals have the same um, qualities, but something else is added to, it, to, to them. They're able to sense the world around them. So animals will look for nutrition, they need food and drink, they will grow, they will reproduce. But they also have senses. They're able to, they are able to know their environment. So they have eyes to see. They have ears to hear. They have noses with which to smell. They have taste, okay, and they can feel. So with these senses, they're able to know their, their environment. So the lamb sees the wolf and immediately the lamb knows this is bad news. The wolf sees a lamb and knows that this is good news. Okay? Instinctively. The, they don't need, the, the, the animals don't need anyone to teach them. They know it from the moment they're born. The other thing about animals is that they are able to, um, they, they all behave in exactly the same way. There's no variation outside of their particular species. Okay. So one animal is basically much the same in the same species, dogs are the same, basically. Okay, they might have slightly different temperaments, but they're basically the same. The third category of animal is the rational, the humans. And we have the same qualities as the, as the grasses, <coughs> the, the, vegeta the, the vegetative cr creatures. In as much as we take in nutrition, we need to eat and drink, we grow, we reproduce, we have senses, five in particular, and then we have something added to this. We have an intellect, the ability to know the purpose of things. In other words, the ability to grasp, to seek the truth. And we have a will, the ability to choose between different options. And this is, in fact, what makes us different. We are not limited to instinct only. So a very good way of looking at it is, or look at, look at the examples. Birds of a particular species always build their nests in exactly the same way. And they'll build it in exactly the same environment. So you'll have, for instance, seagulls. They will always build their nests on rocks overlooking the sea. They will, a seagull wouldn't say, look, it's too dangerous living by the sea. These waves keep coming up and they might knock my nest into the, into the, into the sea. So I'm going to go and build my nest in the forest instead. A seagull won't do that. Similarly, you know, the, um, the owl, which builds its nest usually in, in a high place, um, usually a hole, so that the, 
during the day the lights can't come in. It won't say, you know, I think I need a little more sun today, so I'm going to go and build my, my nest on, on, in the open. <coughs> just doesn't happen. Spiders, according to their species, always build their nests in exactly the same way. So, for instance, a trapdoor spider will always build its nest in the ground. If it's like a trapdoor to, to catch prey. Other spiders will build, it, build their nests in, um, in, in various bushes or trees, so as to catch the kind of insects they like. Okay. Animals don't change their diet. You know, the, the silkworm likes the mulberry tree. It wouldn't say, oh, I'm going to go, I feel like eating um, grass today, or I feel like eating oak today. No, it will always build it in the same way. We, on the other hand, are very different. We are not limited by um, instinct. And so, given the opportunity to design our house, the chances are we will design a house that's totally different from even our brother or our sister. The way we dress is another indication of our individu individuality. We're not limited, unless you live in a communist country where everybody wears exactly the same thing, or in the army where everybody wears exactly the same thing, you know, according to rank. We're, we're not limited. Given the opportunity, we will express ourselves in how we dress, how we um, build our houses, even what we eat. Okay? So, this is because we have the will the ability to choose how to behave. The likeness is what makes a difference. Okay? We're made in God's image and his likeness, but this likeness allows us the ability to choose between various options. So much so that we are capable even of great personal sacrifice, which an animal is not. So, for instance, you have a herd of um, buffalo or, or um, some, some uh, no, buffalo also will do. And um, you have, you have uh, um, the young as well, you know, they, because they, they travel in herds. So you have a young, the, young buffalo, the young buffaloes and so on. Suppose they've been chased by some predator, a mountain lion. The whole herd runs, okay? One of the young stumbles and the lion jumps on it. Would the mother come back and defend the young? No. They keep running. Each man, each buffalo for himself, right? But for us, if we are escaping from danger and our child falls behind, we go back and look and try and see what we can do, even at the point of sacrifice in our own life. Or if you have a stable with horses and it catches fire, okay, the horses get out, they run away. If one of them is trapped, the others won't come back and see what they can do to help. They'll get as far from the fire as possible. Whereas if we have a child or a friend or a brother or even a stranger who is caught in the fire, we will try to help. We will even risk our life because we have that ability to choose. Okay? And this is, in fact, is what defined, defines us. Okay? We have a purpose in life, and we are able to know that purpose, and we are able to choose the means to achieve the purpose. In nature, in ordinary nature, not so. Animals will behave according to their instinct. Now, we, we can l l perceive, we can grasp, we can understand the purpose of things. So we look, we have a screwdriver, we know what it's for, we know what its purpose is. We can misuse it, we can abuse it. We have a chisel, we know what its purpose is. We can use it or abuse it. We look at an animal and we can determine what, it, what its nature is and what its purpose is. 
Okay, it's, it's, we, we have that ability to grasp the purpose, the reason behind things. And this purpose is essentially the law of the nature of the thing. Now, in much of the confusion that we, li we have we experience in our time, in, in this 21st century, is in fact um, focused around reproduction, basically our sexual instincts. And this has led to much confusion in regard to marriage as well. And so we have the arguments being put forward. Well, isn't marriage about love? Well, yes it is. But is it only love? Well, we can look at other cultures and we can see that marriage is not about only love. For instance, that we have what, a co what is called the arranged marriage. We see it in the Bible. It used to be, and I presume it's still very popular, in, um, much used in India, where the couple, um, the, the parents decide who their children will marry. The parents will look at the family of the proposed spouse on both sides and they will come to some arrangement agreement, yes. They will introduce the young couple, sometimes against their will, sometimes with their will. They will say, well, this is your husband, this is your wife, get on with it, you know. And surprisingly for us, surprisingly these marriages work. Some of them don't work, of course. But then equally for us who are able to choose our spouse, some work, some do not work. So we can't say because it doesn't work, it's not valid. Okay? We need to, to, write, to go behind and discover the purpose. So what is the purpose of marriage? And the we can say without doubt that the purpose of marriage is the continuation of the human race, the begetting of children. That's the basic purpose. Now, it's, we say, well, if that is a purpose, we can say the purpose of sex is essentially procreation. But if so, then why do we have to get married? And that b brings in another question, and which will lead to another question. But let's go step by step. If the purpose of sex is procreation, and we can say that with great deal of confidence, because right through nature, animals copulate, they have sex, because, as, uh, because of the need to reproduce themselves. Okay. And outside of, outside of that reason, animals do not um, copulate. They don't have sex outside of the time for reproduction. Unless the female is in heat, they, they do not have sex. Although, of course, there are people who, who, who question that, but that, that is the basic law. So we can see that sex is for procreation. There's something else that comes out of this. Because it's for procreation, then we have to have the, um, the complementary sexes together, male and female, which is how God created them, male and female. Two males cannot reproduce themselves, nor can two females re reduce themselves. So it's complementary. Now, once we, we decide that, one, once we have seen that it's complementary, that, that sex is um, for reproduction and that it needs to be complementary, immediately it puts the same sex issues as something that is quite contrary to nature. Now, people have sex, they indulge in sex for many reasons pleasure 
that's probably the, 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 the biggest reason. But others do it for money. Some others do it for uh, power. Some do it for love. And others do it for revenge, to destroy. But the only reason nature has for sex is, in fact, to procreate. Leaving aside the, the, the um, bad reasons, we can see that, essentially, most people are attracted to sex for the pleasure it gives. So this is the bait that nature places in our way. Because it is pleasurable, we are likely to indulge. And because we indulge, we reproduce. Because if there were no pleasure, then it's very unlikely many people would indulge. And in fact, that's, that's the, the, it's that bait that causes so much of the problem. In a similar way, we have, we, there's pleasure in eating. You know, we eat because we're hungry, or we eat to be sociable. <coughs> we, but nature's purpose for us eating is to nourish ourselves. If, we, if the food is not tasty, if it has no salt, we eat it if we're hungry, and if we're not, we'll wait until we can get some salt. You know? We are driven by pleasure, and that itself is not wrong, as long as it remains reasonable. If we seek only pleasure, we're going to find ourselves in, uh, trapped. You know, we find ourselves in um, slaves, we find ourselves as addicts. So it's pleasure, the, the pleasure instinct itself has to be controlled by our reason. The will has to be disciplined so that, yes, this is good, but nonetheless it's not good right now. Or um, th th this is not good for me at this particular moment. This, because of this reasoning, the church has always taught that contraception is intrinsically, by its very nature, evil. Because what contraception does is to separate the love, the unitive, the pleasure part of the act, from its finality. What is nature's purpose, or better still, what is God's purpose? When we separate the two, then we run the, the risk of seeking only the pleasure to exclusion of God. And of course, when God is excluded, we are really in serious trouble. Nature really basically wants to multiply itself. We see that all through creation. We see how abundant, abundantly animals reproduce themselves. We, we could even say it's wasted. Let, let's, if you look, for instance, at the, at the turtle. You know, the turtle comes out of the sea, digs a hole, great labor, lays its eggs, sometimes hundreds of eggs, covers it up and goes back to the sea. The eggs hatch. And suddenly, the, the, again, instinctively, we find all the, eggs, all the eggs hatching at the same time. And you see these little turtles struggling to get out, and they run to the sea instinctively. And then the prey, the, the birds of prey, or animals of prey, descend on them. And so the birds instinctively know, and they come and they eat up as many of these turtles, little baby turtles, as they can. Those who manage to escape the birds get into the water. And there, there's another set of, of um, water creatures, fish, waiting for them. Okay. And these thousands of, of turtles, and perhaps only you know, a small percentage, actually get through to grow to, be, to adults. You know? Or when you, when you look at the fruit on the tree, there's more fruit than anyone can, can, can possibly count, yet there's sufficient for, for all of God's creatures. 
No. So when we, in, and this is perhaps an aside, we, we reach a stage now where people are talking about there are too many human beings. That is not possible. There can't be too many human beings on the earth. The earth is big enough for all of God's creatures. No matter how many, many of us uh, there are, there will always be sufficient room. So we, we have to be careful about the words that we have and the reasons why people bring up these various arguments. So the, we have, um, as, as rational creatures, to we understand the purpose of our of of, um, of sex and and with it of, of marriage. So sex is for procreation. Marriage, marriage is for the offspring. That's the reason for it, for the children, because the church again tells us that the purpose of marriage is the the begetting and the education of children. Now, by the education of children, the church does not mean that they must learn, you know, for us, English, maths, biology, you know, sciences, and, and so on. That's not what they mean by education. What, we, what the church means is the moral formation of the person, essentially to be a good person. That is the purpose, for the child to grow up to be a good person. And you don't have to be paid to, um, to do it, to be good. You have to um, uh, be, be trained so as to do instinctively the right things, which we call virtue. So that you know instinctively it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to lie. And if you fall into, into doing those things, to be ashamed of it, not to boast of it, not to say that, well, everybody should be lying, everybody should be stealing. No, we recognize there are absolutes, the virtues, and correspondingly the vices, and that we must strive to do, to, to do the virtuous thing and avoid doing the evil thing. So, for that to happen, well, it's going to take a long time, because the, ch the child matures perhaps 15, perhaps 25. It takes a long time for us to grow up. You know, it takes a long time for us to become independent of our parents physically. You know, we, we can perhaps get away with it 14, 15, where we can cook for ourselves and so on. But the other things that we need, the emotional support, the growth, the example, that takes a lot longer. And for that to happen, you need to have the parents to be together for a long time. So we could say a minimum of 18 years. Now, that's for the first child. There are others who are fo following. And so you need to have lifelong relationship between the parents. Okay. Also, because um, um, the, 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 the children need both parents, then you the, it's necessary that the parents be together. To, they need to be faithful. So the church says, and not just the church, the scriptures tell us that, that you should be um, complementary, one man, one woman, that they should be united all their lives, that they should be faithful to each other. Okay. Um, and essentially, that's why marriage is necessary. Um, so the parents then form the children in their intellect, so they present to them what is good and give them the discipline so that they always strive to do that which is good. The, the, the mother, the woman, usually is the one who would be le help, le would literally be helpless if the father were not present all the time. And in fact, in, in today's gospel, where we heard of the widow of Sarafta, who um, had the only son, and without her husband to provide for her, she was literally eking out her living, you know, collecting sticks and saying, when we have eaten this meal, this is our last meal, we're, we're done for, because I have no one to provide for me. 
Whereas with the father present, he's there to guard, protect the family, and so on. Having said this, the, the, the affection that parents have for each other is also important. That is the love aspect. But remember that love is not just a matter of the feelings, the senses. So how many young people madly in love with, with each other and they, they're determined to get married against the advice of um, their, their parents? And then after a year, two years, they hate each other with such a passion. They depended on the feelings. Whereas love belongs to the will, the choosing. I choose you from all the women in the world to be my wife. I choose you from all the men to be my husband. And better or worse, rich or poorer, I'm going to stick to this promise. We make a decision. And then love uh, is a matter of sacrifice. So continually, both spouses have to sacrifice themselves for each other. And the kind of sacrifice the man makes is different from the kind of sacrifice the woman makes. And St. Paul tells us this in the letter to the Ephesians. You know, St. Paul says, wives, obey your husbands, because that's where the difficulty arises. And then, he says to husbands, love your wives, because that's where the difficulty arises. We're only commanded to do the things that are difficult. So when St. Paul says, husbands, love your wives, he goes on to say how. He said, he said as Christ loved the church, how did Christ love the church? He was willing to be beaten for her. He was willing to be insulted for her, spat upon, crucified for her. So if a woman has a, has a husband who's willing to die for her, of course she'd be obedient because she recognizes that he's willing to sacrifice his life. So she's willing to sacrifice her will. And the two go together like, like a, um, a, a lock and a key. The two m must go together. So essentially then, this love that we speak about in marriage it's not an affection, it's not just the senses, but it's essentially our reason, our intellect, our understanding, and our will. And this, in fact, is what gives us um, what we call morality. Morality consists essentially in behaving according to nature. It is accepting the purpose, that things have a purpose, and accepting that purpose and trying to, to live in conformity with the purpose. And that is the heart of, of morality. So then, the, the, um, the, the nat all of this, when we talk about rational creatures, we talk not of the law of nature, but we talk of the natural law. The natural law. That is the law that governs the behavior of human beings. And it's, it's not, in, it's, it's, it's um, difficult, but it is not impossible. It's difficult simply because we are fallen beings, we suffer from concupiscence and selfishness and so on, but nonetheless, with Christ as an example, with, as our example, and with the saints to give us examples showing us it is possible, we can in fact live according to the law of nature and know the purpose for which we were created, namely to know God, to love God, His will, and to serve God, doing His will. And the end game, what we're doing all of this for, is nothing other than to be happy with God forever. So whilst we live in, a, in this modern world with so much confusion, confusion over words, if we go back to the basic meaning of things, you know, we, when, so when we hear um, these incredible statements like um, to, to say to a transgender person or homosexual person, um, God loves you. God made you so and God loves you. 
Yes, God loves the sinner. That's absolutely true. But God does not love the sin. Christ himself said to the woman who was caught in adultery, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Do not sin again. To the man by the well who's there for 30, but the man by the pool of Siloam, who was there for 38 years after our Lord healed him, he, our Lord said to the man, do not sin again, otherwise something worse will befall you. you know, so sin is essentially to reject the purpose for which we were created. God loves us as sinners. This is absolutely true. But God, God does not want us to remain sinners. He wants us to reject our sin. And so, he, as our Lord himself said, he came to call sinners to repentance. Let us then pray to Our Lady, the Seat of Wisdom, that we be not deceived by the words that are used and can so easily lead us astray. But let us hold fast to the one word which God has spoken forever and ever, that is Jesus Christ our Lord. Ave Maria. When we see these things happening around us, the confusion, are we to accept it and say, oh well, um, that's okay, it's everywhere, that's the way it is? Or are we as Catholics, to, with every breath in our body, to protest against it? No, we can't say that that's okay. It's not okay. We have a a duty and even a right to protest against it. Um, today's gospel, you are the salt of the earth. And you know, if, if you've had a, a bruise or a cut um, and you put salt on it, what, what happens? It stings, doesn't it? But the salt helps it, the wound to heal, you know. Um, of course, today we don't like anything that hurts, so we will get some other um, antiseptic or something that doesn't sting. But it takes longer to heal, even <laughs> if you notice. Um, and th that's what we are supposed to be to the world. So we, the very fact that we protest, you know, it's like the sting that, that the salt would give to the open wound, but nonetheless it will help to heal because. Um, um, I'm convinced that most people are idealists and they know what's right and they will try to live uh, to, according to what's right or at least support what is right. And especially true among young people. I really do believe that. Um, but if we, if we are lukewarm and say it's okay, then nobody will take us seriously and we're going to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So, no, I, th I think we, we have to, 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 to cr be cruel, to be kind, yes. I think we do have to be cruel, to be kind. Yeah. And it's interesting, though, also, that as long as the church taught clearly the moral principles, she was always under attack. The moment that we went soft on these issues, well, We've, been, we've seen that no one pays attention. In fact, they, they reject us as, you know, of no consequence. So I, 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 I regard the attacks on the church as a positive sign. It shows that there's life in, in Holy Mother Church. There's still life there. Adam, when you were talking about confusion in the world today, how would you look at people who give more attention or care more for animals than they do for their fellow human beings and especially in our country where the papers go to town on um, cruelty to animals and yet don't ignore the cruelty to unborn children or to children and families and um, we seem to be very twisted in our um, attitude towards human beings as opposed to animals. Um. It's, it's um, again, a twisted way of 
looking at um, creation. And it comes, uh, and the underlying root, I believe, is evolution, that the people have imbibed the whole idea of evolution and simply see us as the, the highest end of, of, the, of um, I can't say creation because they don't believe in God, the highest end of, of um, this, this world. And therefore, we ought to be uh, helping those who are, who are um, less able to help themselves, basically the animals. Um, and it's, it's simply a turning away from, the, from God, the, the image and likeness you know, of God who, that, that's found in each and every one of us. Um, so I, I think evolution is, is, is greatly to be blamed for that. Um, you, you get, again, you have the, 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 the craziness. You say, we have to save the world for animals. Well, if we look, if we take a really objective look at the, at the world, every, everything is really food for something else. You know, the, 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 the beasts eat the grass, the, fl the plants, and then the beasts eat each, each, each other. And we, in fact, eat, in turn, eat animals. But what's, what I'm afraid of, what I see coming, is the time when we will go back, go back, uh, when we will accept cannibalism. Because now human nature, um, the, the whole way things are moving, and there, there is a, an increase in demand for euthanasia. And this is not among, it's not for or among people who are sick or who are elderly. But we find that younger and younger people are looking to be euthanized. Um, now, the argument you can see is, well, we're all animals. If we can eat the sheep and the pig and the cow and so on, well, why can't we eat human flesh? After all, there are whole civilizations that used to do so. I mean, the Aztecs, for instance, in Mexico, um, agreed that they, they would eat only the, the, the flesh of, of warriors and so on. But nonetheless, the principle is established. Um, and already, in some places, the, um, the flesh of unborn children is already being canned for eating by humans. Um, we already know that, that the, again, the, un, the unborn, the, the aborted children are being used for animal feed, you know. So eventually, in fact, if it's used for animal feed, then of course we're already um, uh, digesting it. But, but I think it will, before long, we will see that coming. I know it's a horrible thing to say, but the, the, what is to prevent it? What arguments are there against it? I mean, it's, it's if, if the only argument is that it's culturally um, unacceptable, but the culture is changing. The Aztecs did it. You know, in the South, in the Pacific Islands, it, it was common. And if you go back further in history, you know, in many other places, South America, it was a common um, um, practice. Brian, uh, talking about eating human flesh, um, I don't know whether this is right or not. Um, I haven't been able to check it, you know, um, see whether it's true or not. Um, I read it that uh, they're using um, babies, you know, their babies' bodies. They dry them up and they use it for capsules for to improve men's ability. So um, yes. in this situation, how do we go about it? Because it's very, very worrying and you don't even know whether it will extend to other countries. Uh, yes, the, the, there is evidence of, of that happening. How, how to prevent it, I, I think, um, is by being vigilant, um, looking at, at least that we still have the the um, the regulations where 
medication and, and so on, you have to know what it contains. But even that, of course, we know can be disguised. Um, so, how, pardon me, how can we avoid it? It's going to be difficult. But the first thing is to know that this is happening. And the second thing is to say that it is happening. Evil flourishes best in darkness and in silence. That's, that's why the, the, um, in, in the case of abortion, the people who support abortion do not want the, 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 the pictures of aborted children to be shown. They don't want it to be shown because they know it will cause such a revulsion that they might very well lose the battle. It was the same with slavery. Um, the brutality that the, um, the slaves experience, you know, as long as it remained hidden, it could, slavery could be tolerated. It's when pictures were shown of the actual um, uh, condition the f of the slaves you know, the, 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 the lashes on their back, torn flesh and so on. When, it was only when that was shown that uh, there, there was a turning away against slavery. No. So as long as evil is hidden, as long as it's in the dark and not spoken of, it will flourish. To, to reverse that, it means to let the light shine on it. Let it be seen, let evil be seen for what it is, because we will instinctively turn away from it. Uh, many years ago, at the general election, I think it was the Christian party or the Spock for Life, had prepared a video you know, to put on television to show what babies and what was happening, and the BBC um, banned it and wouldn't show it, saying it would be too cruel to show, and yet the hypocrisy of the BBC, who has such much, so much violent programmes on TV all the time, but as you say, they didn't want people to see about the babies because of the effect it would have had on the boat. I just want to go back a bit. If a parent, they've got children, and say one of them turned out to be like him, they own sex. The parents would talk to the child, of course, but what are they to do? Should they throw them out in the street? No. How can they deal with that? Or how should they deal with it? I th you deal with the, the problem in the most charitable way possible. If your, if your child is um, crippled, born with a club foot, do you throw it out on the street? No, if your child is born with Down syndrome, do you throw it out on the street? No. no. You know, so, I mean, if, if uh, a physical or a mental uh, psychological problem, you would accept a child. If a child is insane, you know, you try to, to, to nurture, to love the child, you know, unless of course it's beyond your ability, such as violence or something can't be controlled. You know, you try and do it. And so also, f for even for moral um, problems, um, and uh, uh, homosexuality is it's not, um, it's, it's, a, it's a psychological, it's spiritual, um, it's emotional issue. So you deal with the child in the most charitable way possible, you know. Um, and, th and I think that's, that's how you deal with it. You, so you, you'd look for the professionals who could help, who can help, you know. Um, and of course, you also ask the help of the Lord. In other words, you pray. You know, pray, and we finish, pray again. Um, and we, again, we have so many saints who've done exactly that. Uh, and one of the classic, she's always brought up, Saint Monica, who prayed for her son, who had um, no, he, he, he was immoral. And he, to add insult to injury, he, was also, he also joined heretical sect. And Mon Saint Monica just wept and wept and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And we have, as a result, 
Saint Augustine, one of the four doctors of the church and the greatest of the fathers, you know, um, in, in, the, in the Western church. You know, m most of our uh, uh, moral uh, theology is based on his work, his, his experience. You know, so we, we don't throw out, we don't throw out anybody because of, you know, what they are. We're all children of God. We all have um, defects, greater or lesser, but defects nonetheless. Those who have greater defects, I believe, uh, 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 d d d need the greatest love. You know, it's, and perhaps in many ways they're closer to God. Our Lord tells us that again. And the other thing is, always try to remember to use the scriptures as much as possible. Our, our Lord said to, I think, it was Simon the leper. You know, he says, Simon, the man had two um, creditors who couldn't, um, they, um, sorry, the two creditors, right? One owed f 50, what is it, denarii, was it? And the other one owed 500, I think. I can't remember the figures. You know, they couldn't pay. So he forgave them both. Which one would love him more? The one who's forgiven more. So greater sinners, when they when they're converted, have a greater love for God than those who have fewer sins to forgive. Th does that answer your question? Regarding obedience to the husband, um, is this to be taken literally, practically? Because sometimes if the wife is just more sensible, has better judgment, <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be... Uh, uh, yeah, it would be good to just blindly follow what the husband says. Uh, so what, what does that mean? No, it's, it's not blind obedience, okay? Just as we don't have blind faith, you know, we, we have reason, you know. Um, the, and, and so the, the obedience um, means a, a readiness to ac accept a decision that has been made. And, and women have uh, the faculty to get around men. You know, you, you, it's, it's possible to, to reason with your with a husband. Um, you think of, the, of um, Samson and Delilah, <laughs> you know, bad example, I suppose, in, when, when married. But um, it's, The word obedience comes from Latin, ob, because of audire, to hear. Okay? So you hear what is being said and you follow through. <coughs> you know? So if you, if you end up in a situation where there's a, a stubbornness um, is, is um, in, in the offering, then it's better of willing to get around the obstacle. For, let, let's take an example. The, uh, the raising of children. Usually husbands, the fathers are more stern, more demanding, you know. Um, and the mothers are more protective, okay. The, the two are necessary. Now, the, 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 the mother might, might take a, a, a stand that, you know, I don't want you to, to, to discipline the child, you know. And so you can, you, you can c c come to some agreement about the kind of discipline. But nonetheless, the discipline is, is necessary. Because the way men and women think are very different, despite what the, the we we're currently told. To give you, okay, to give you an example. You have a six, eight-year-old baby. The mother will cuddle the baby and protect the baby. The father comes along. He takes the baby, throws the baby in the air. What's the reaction of the mother? <laughs> what's, the baby, what's the reaction of the child? Yeah, the child likes it because the child trusts the father. The father will always be there to catch me. And so it builds a trust for the father. This is the way that men um, relate to their children. They're there 
and the child knows the dad will always be there to, to, to catch me. Whereas mom is always there to protect me. Okay? But if you only have that protection all the time, then the child is afraid of risk, of, of afraid of danger. The, the, the fears that there's no one there to catch. Yeah? Um, we are such complex psychological, psychologically uh, as beings that it's, you know. It, it uh, isn't that, um, so you see that there is a great confusion nowadays about um, what, I what is the role of the husband and the role of the wife? And um, because the current um, secular culture is that they go for equality. Mm -hmm. But God did not create husband and wife um, in that way, in the sense that they got equal dignity, but not but they the complement. They complement. They're complementary, but the, they don't have. He hasn't created them with the same role. So the husband, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe the traditional teaching is that God created the husband with the, the state of grace of being the head of the family, the wife to be uh, the husband. Um, help me, and uh, and is this uh, kind of a communion that produces the uh, proper God-created family, a sort of a husband and wife, a wife relationship, but um, without the respect of this kind of a hierarchy and complementarity, it's a lot of problems come out of that. This is tied perfectly. <laughs> and your Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. We give thee thanks, O Lord, for these and all thy benefits, who lives and reigns world without end. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord's with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady Fatima, pray for us. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit.